It's 2013, and it's another season of dismal expectations for the Toronto Raptors. As the only Canadian market in a league dominated by American culture, the team has long been on the periphery of the NBA landscape. The organization has neither been close to championship aspirations since its inaugural season in 1995. Its most celebrated periods with players like Vince Carter and Chris Bosh have been equally tempered by the bitter, unceremonious exits of these stars. With more upheaval on the way, the season is finally expected to usher in a full-scale rebuild with new general manager Masai Ujiri. This includes a rebuild of the organizational philosophy, which becomes an effort to redefine the team's identity in time for their 20th anniversary. The Toronto Raptors director of marketing was watching a pitch, one that moved him so completely, he wanted to run it back to the Bay Street offices of MLSE and show it to colleagues. Everyone was smitten, especially President and CEO Tim Laiwiki and Raptors general manager Masai Ujiri, who both wanted the campaign to be launched right away. So what exactly was everyone so excited about? Three simple words. We. The North. These three words have had a transcendent impact, not only in the franchise, but arguably as a cultural Canadian touchstone. And yet it could only ever be half the story. Its premise on its own was still only an idea, a thesis. An exciting new brand for a mediocre on-court product would have meant nothing. It needed a body of work to support it. People in Toronto don't care what happened to the Raptors. All they care about is the Maple Leafs in Toronto. If this Raptors team became decent, I don't even know if it would really matter in Toronto, would it? Terrence Ross going right. So it's by some act of providence that this same bleak looking season dramatically changes over the course of the year. The team exceeds all expectations on the strength of their two young stars, and the Raptors reach a season record for wins. Good for the third seed, and playoff bound in a city starved for success. As Bill Simmons put it, for Toronto at this time, professional sports began and ended with its ill-fated hockey club, the Toronto Maple Leafs. But after years of mediocrity and a spectacular meltdown in a rare playoff appearance, the Maple Leafs were finally expected to rebuild that year. It was the right climate to shift the city's view of its professional sports landscape. Six years from its launch, We the North has solidified as arguably the most compelling marketing campaign in Canadian history. And it was fortunately carried by a very compelling product. But the reasons for its success go far beyond the circumstances of its team, and are in fact embedded right within those three simple words. So where do the words come from, and why do they resonate with so many people? Despite the significant publicity and viral nature of We the North after its initial unveiling, it's not even the first three-word ad campaign that captured the nationwide attention of Canadians. This ad made its mark in March of 2000 during the 72nd Academy Awards. Hey, Rob Williams was hosting that night and he did a little bit from the South Park movie called Blame Canada. Just as he finished that, they went to commercial and the commercial was the rant. And that the beaver is a truly proud and noble animal. The tooth is a hat, the Chesterfield is a coach, and it is pronounced said, not Z, Z. It's the answer to every stereotype I'd heard during three and a half years of my friends basically taking the piss out of me. And of course, it concludes with the now iconic words. America, my name is Joe, and I I Am Canadian and The Rant went on to form the backbone of Molson Canadian's wildly successful marketing strategy for the next two decades. Numerous spoofs, products, and subsequent commercials have all borrowed from this slogan. Its success was in large part due to its good-natured, self-deprecating humor. <laughs> New dude <to> beauty! <laughs> but perhaps more importantly, it addressed a very real feeling and truth of living in the shadow of its bordering neighbor. Thus, by leaning into these stereotypes, it was able to reimagine them into a point of national pride and shared culture. That being different was good and worth celebrating. 
If this sounds familiar, that's because it was the same guiding ethos of Sid Lee, the brand agency that eventually created We The North. It was about taking that sort of negative perception and turning it into our positive strength. But with the change in times, as well as the opportunity to coordinate their rebrand with a certain popular Canadian rapper, the team was challenged with finding a different tone for the same message. In order to capture a national audience for an otherwise often maligned city, this idea had to be bigger than one place. It had to feel shared and democratic. A few things. How do we make this relevant across Canada? How do we win over the hearts and minds of Canadians? One of the first things is we had to really make sure that when we put out the marketing campaign now known as the movement We the North, it meant something to Canadians, not just Torontonians. Perhaps then, despite the irony, it was inevitable that they borrowed from the guiding words on equality and democracy from those very same neighbours to the south because it specifically echoes the modern thesis for democracy, one found in the preamble of the U.S. Constitution that begins, We, the people. I think it's in the story of these words that underscores why this idea became so fixed and how a basketball team's motto could feel like something greater. Because We the North's full meaning and impact is inseparable from the original implications of the 250-year-old words it invokes. America is what we, the people, make of it. This is the thesis for modern democracy, distilled to its simplest form. It both neatly summarizes and introduces the guiding principles of the world's now oldest functioning constitution. We, the people, is no stranger to imitation. The preamble has been copied into the constitutions of India, South Korea, Brazil, and even modern-day Russia, among many others. The words persist because they identify the most irrefutable element of this new form of government. That the power of the government does not, should not, come from right of power or birth, but is bestowed by the people, for the people. It's an idea that people are still fighting for today. Like we the people, we the North is a statement of irrefutable shared ownership. It articulated this kind of truth that anyone who identified with its message was already part of a self-evident collective citizenship. It should come as no surprise then that one of the central stories of the We the North era has been of its fan base and the way they embraced this egalitarian spirit. First of all, uh, you get, do you hear this? No, do you hear incredible. this? And perhaps neither should it have come as a surprise that a place of immigrants could identify with a sport represented by more visible minorities than the country's more famous cultural pastime. It helps that the words also reflected a style and intonation of more modern hip-hop culture. And so to sample the words like an artist sampling from an older classic, it carries both old meaning and new. A reimagining of the most fundamental American principle? Sure. Sounding like DJ Khaled's next big hit? We the best music! Yeah, that too. DJ Khaled. It speaks to the idea that sports belong to more than just those who play them. They belong to communities, to fans, to physical locations. They exist as entertainment and as culture. But they also exist as propaganda. The corollary to appreciating the goodness of an ad campaign is that it fundamentally exists to sell you something. In the cases of We the North and I am Canadian, the focus of their marketing strategies specifically relied on vague, romanticized ideas of this quote-unquote great white North. In both cases, it was selling a kind of brand membership that one earned through the imagined hardships of enduring the rugged wilderness of this region. It was certainly fortunate that their version of the North was endorsed by arguably the cultural zeitgeist of its generation. Winter is coming. Winter is coming. Winter is coming! This is despite a fairly similar climate to the rest of the northern contiguous United States. In fact, Toronto is only the third most northern city in the NBA, after Minnesota and Portland. Al Thraptus! Evoking emotion to convey subjective truth is not a new idea, nor is it necessarily problematic. Sports culture and fandom is arguably all about ideas of subjective truth, and this is part of what makes it organic 
and compelling. I let you talk. I didn't say a word. But dialogue in sports also has a profound effect on everyday conversations. And there are side effects from relying on an emotional premise, especially when it invokes the language of American exceptionalism and the rhetoric of nationalism, ideas that remain relevant today. You cannot disrespect our country, our flag, our anthem. You cannot do that. On one hand, it's admirable how effectively a marketing team took the qualities of a rousing, patriotic statement and turned it into an instantly relatable and yet classic rallying cry. But by that same token, it inevitably draws comparisons to the more poisonous qualities of discourse in sports, and both the subtle and not-so-subtle propaganda that exists throughout it. Where patriotism or fandom means dedication without reason or humility, and where anybody who is not with you is against you. I hate you! I think these problems are fittingly reflected in We the North's unique political inspiration. Because we the people, this proud symbol for American democracy, was itself never an objectively true statement, certainly not at its inception. We the people did not include women, nor the slaves for whom the same document carefully outlines as less than a person. We shouldn't forget we're also fundamentally flawed. We have our own history, and we have our own opportunities to kind of understand and empathize other people's point of view. But if there is a meaningful, optimistic through line, it would be this. If We the People was part of a flawed narrative, then what was true was the belief it was an idea worth holding sacred. An idea to be fought for in the American Civil War fought for against injustice during the civil rights movement, and fought for still, even today. We are seeing before our very eyes the way that these beliefs, these politics and ideas of justice and equality bleed into sports, and that sports, as a microcosm for society, will continue to serve as a theater to influence the broader global conversations. So despite my reservations, I think one of the reasons We the North was so powerful is that rather than shying away from politics, it embraced them. It recognized that politics, in all its shapes and forms, will be as much a part of sports as the human beings who participate in them. It understood that identity and expression belong to sports in so much as the people participating in them continue to have identities and beliefs and that it should reflect the story of the people it represented as much as those people would put themselves into its story. We the North, despite its idyllic facade of the true North strong and free, had a demonstrable, real positive effect on what it meant to be Canadian, regardless of the accuracy or exclusivity of its claims. It helped redefine unfashionable ideas of snowshoes and shoveling into a point of intense personal pride and newfound identity, particularly in its younger, multicultural audience. The Raptors brand today is in a much different place, and the campaign has been a key cog in the steps made to rehabilitate the Raptors brand. In the short term, the campaign easily achieved its objectives for social interactions and viewership. Five years later, and prior to their championship run, the Raptors' value was fifth in the league in year-over-year gains. The organization has since surpassed the storied Maple Leafs brand and value, despite both teams enjoying sustained, recent success. Though the data overall is too noisy to really separate the team's success from We the North's impact, the tagline has become synonymous with the Toronto Raptors, the city, and maybe even the country, in a way very few marketing taglines get to be. It heralded a new wave of civic pride that could be easily and proudly displayed. And it was another stamp of confirmation that sports would always reflect a core part of Toronto's identity, in the same way it remained a core part of its unique skyline. It's no coincidence that an enormous number of sports apparel and Canadian companies have since co-opted the use of the North in the wake of the campaign's success. At one point, there was a shift to an alternate tagline, but I think the return to We the North demonstrates that the brand's power and meaning 
wasn't just overt Canadian nationalism, but a more nuanced, subconscious idea of shared ownership and democracy. Of course, one great slogan does not make a great team. The totality of the Raptor's success could never simply be captured by an advertising slogan. Its message had to be proven each time they took the court. This change was driven by new leadership, new vision, but most importantly, the on-court success of an unlikely group of outsiders themselves. The campaign was more than just a geographic location or a declaration about sports. It was a cultural and shared lived experience that was relatable to all those who lived it. It was about how sport could transform culture and perspective. And it was about three simple words that captured the prevailing pride in a people. We, the Canadian people. We the North.